Welcome to the Dynamics Hot Dish, the podcast where Ashley Steiner, Allie Nelson, and Liz McLennan dish up the latest news and insights about Dynamics and the Power Platform. Join us to explore business applications and low-code development with tips, tricks, and real-world experiences. So grab a seat at the table and let's dig in. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Dynamics Hot Dish. If you haven't already, subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Go ahead and follow us on other social platforms like LinkedIn, Instagram, and our newly formed TikTok. You can find us on all the platforms under the handle of Dynamics Hot Dish. And we are thrilled to have a special guest on our podcast this week. We have Eric Newell, who's the CEO and founder of Stone Ridge Software. Um, That also happens to be where I work. And Liz and I have known Eric for a while now, so we're really excited to have our conversation with him today. Eric, could you give our listeners a brief introduction of who you are? Yes, thank you so much for having me on. I've been bugging Ali to to get on the the podcast, so I'm excited to be here with everyone. So I'm Eric Newell. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Stone Ridge Software. I've been in the dynamic space now for about 25 years. So I started at Microsoft back in uh, 99 and worked my way through GP and CRM and uh, then led a team managing the, the AX 2012, 2009 kind of timeframe and then went off to start Stone Ridge in 2012. So Stone Ridge will be 11 years old here next month and we are a full service Microsoft Dynamics business applications partner. So we do everything from finance and operations, CRM, business central, and then Microsoft 365 and Azure. And I am based in the very small town of Barnesville, Minnesota, where we started the company. And uh, yeah, that's that's a little about me. Thanks, Great. Eric. And I also used to work at Stone Ridge, full disclaimer. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was the CE practice there, practice director there for a while, and it was awesome working with you, Eric, and I'm really excited to chat with you today. Um, Eric, a little bit a fun tidbit. What is Barnesville known for in the summer? <laughs> so Barnesville has the Potato Days Festival every summer at the end of August. So everything potatoes from mashed potato wrestling to potato peeling contests to potato picking contests to uh, all sorts of little Miss Tater Tot my daughters were in when they were were young as well, too. And then I run the Minnesota Whist tournament that we have there every year. And then my friend Leah and I have gotten to play on stage as well there, too, because we like to play guitar and sing. So that is the, the big festival that we have every year in Barnesville, which is pretty fun. That's awesome. Allie, have you ever had a chance to go? I haven't, and I actually just found out about it this year. And as soon as I heard the words mashed potato wrestling, I was like, I'm like, I'm sorry. Well, I, I've heard that you need to sign up earlier in, like, it says multi-day, because they can get kind of gross if it's hot out later on in the festival. Oh, yeah, but, that's a good point. Like, glee. But, Ellie, I never got to go either, so this next summer, let's go together. <laughs> all right. We definitely should okay. do that. We could do a podcast episode. We could just all be you know, wearing potato themed costumes. It should be kind of fun. I like it. It's a plan. And for the uh, potato picking contest too, why do I feel like this is a way to get farmers to just have people pick the potatoes for them? Yeah, it it certainly is. You probably started that way. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, there's like a golden potato or something that someone finds that you're the winner. I, I don't, I haven't actually participated in that one. I haven't done the mashed potato wrestling but I've watched that one. They also have like a strong man competition where you have to like raise sacks of potatoes up on, you know, increasingly high forklifts. You know, they got all the, all the fun stuff. Wow. Who knew you could do oh. that much stuff with potatoes? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Should we get on to our real topics for today? <laughs> it's a big one. So yeah, let's do it. I know. Okay. So obviously this year's been, uh, had a lot of big news around AI and all the changes in innovation in our space. So Eric, our first question for you is about 
what are some of the trends that you've seen um, in the space recently? And give us opinion on where you think Microsoft technology is headed. Well, I think Microsoft is in such a great position with the just the breadth of technology they have across the business systems, everything from the productivity side in Microsoft 365, you know, to Azure, you see the big announcements that they have partnering with many other Oracle and others on Azure, like it's become such a great business platform for the cloud. And then of course, you know, my biggest passion around the Dynamics products as well too, I think they continue to pick up speed and continue to be like more of the obvious choice from what businesses should invest in because you can get everything from Microsoft as opposed to with other vendors where you have to piece together, you know, a cloud strategy plus a business application strategy plus a different CRM perhaps. So Microsoft has all of that going for them, but what they're really talking all about now is, is AI and how they're going to infuse AI into all their different products. So I'm excited to see what's going to happen when, when the Microsoft 365 Windows Copilot comes out in November. We're certainly starting to see more and more of it in the business application space, but there's so much cool stuff that they can be doing there that uh, I think that's going to be, be their big focus over the next few years, which is pretty exciting. How do you think that people should be learning about the new technology that Microsoft is rolling out? I know that it can be overwhelming, right? We've been hearing about Copilot for months. Now we're hearing about more rollouts and Viva sales. How do you recommend that organizations can stay on top of all of the announcements to make sure that they're getting the newest technologies as they're available? Yeah, it's a challenging job, right? Like staying up with all the stuff Microsoft is releasing as a full-time job. I mean, I spend you know, my evenings reading up on things, watching YouTube videos, watching Microsoft announcements, just to try to stay on top of what's going on. So it can be a lot of work. And with AI in particular, there's uh, learning about what AI really is and how it's useful is something people haven't really figured out yet. Like, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to try to figure out how it's going to be useful. But yeah, I watch YouTube channels to, to try to stay up on things. Uh, obviously, Microsoft sends us as an inner circle partner a lot of information as well, too. So I get to read up on that. And uh, so it's it's a lot of work if you want to keep up with all of that stuff. But that's that's one way to do it. You know, we at Stone Ridge try to send out newsletters every month to keep to cap, encapsulate some of the offerings. And then we've got our blog that's pretty active with offerings as well too. And another thing we do is every other Thursday, we do this event called Confab where we talk about the latest technology and what's going on there too. So try to share as much information as we can, but there's a lot to be shared. There definitely is. It's, it's a lot of work to keep up with all of it. Um, what are you most excited about, I think, Eric, from an AI perspective? Like, is there a particular use case in an industry? I know have Stone Ridge has industry focuses, or um, have you gotten to play around with Copilot? Like, is there anything that stands out to you that you're most excited for? Yeah, I'm really excited about the customer service experience in particular. And I'm not just saying that because Allie does that kind of work. <laughs> but that truly is the area that I'm most excited about because I have had just not very much fun customer service experiences as a consumer with different people that I've been trying to get information from where they have using chatbots. And, and then the chatbots are no good because they don't really tell you anything. And then you get involved with a person and then you have to explain who you are to them again. And then you have to ask these questions that they can't answer and then they go to their supervisor. But like what with the generative AI, what that can do for customer service, I think is really going to transform it because now you don't have to program everything that you're doing with a chatbot, like using the power of the large language model. It can answer those questions from just information in your knowledge base or on the web in general. And I think that's going to make you know, automated customer service so much more effective and efficient and even better as a consumer than it has been in the past because you'll be able to go in and I oftentimes, you know, busy during the day and 
go to my kids' events and things like that. So sometimes I'm trying to interact with customer service at like 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night. And, uh, you know, then they're not available and like chat's not available or whatever. But if I could go and experience a virtual agent that could answer those questions for me well at an off hour of the night, like that would be such a better improvement than what we have today. And so I think there's so much opportunity in the customer service side with generative AI in particular. So I'm really excited about that. I know we've done We've scratched the surface with some of our clients on, on this work, but I think there's a lot more that we can do. So I think a lot of us, what you just said is super relatable. And I think a lot of us have had those really bad customer service experiences, not only on the phone with like different menu options that you have to press for infinity and nothing ever matches and you have to just hit zero <laughs> until someone answers, but then also with chatbots, where I've had one recently with Ulta Beauty, actually, where I just kept going in a circle. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm hitting your prompts. Why do you keep sending me just like in a circle? How do you think businesses can overcome those obstacles that they've had in the past and kind of retrain their customers that now we're using AI and it's a better experience as opposed to like a negative experience that you've had in the past? I think that's going to be a big hurdle for companies to overcome. I do too. And I think they almost, they have to start from scratch. They need to just reimagine the experience. Cause what I see a lot of companies trying to do is like, think of this as like an additive thing. It's like, oh, I'm going to add a chat bot and that's going to make my experience a lot better. Well, if your chat bot can only answer 10 questions, like what are your hours or something like that? I mean, you can read that on the website already. So they have to like, just start over again and go, okay, if I'm at, if I'm coming at into with, you know, these 10 or 15 different scenarios, what should that experience look like? And how can I make that experience a good one for our, our customers? And, and then think about, you know, where would, where would they want to start with that entrance? Would they want to start on our main web page? Is there a support page? And then what happens if somebody gets stuck? I think one of the things that I find most frustrating as a consumer is when you get stuck and there isn't a place to go for a call to make or a person to talk to. Now, I think the experience with virtual agents and with generative AI is going to be so much better that you hopefully aren't going to have to do that as much. But like, I see a lot of customer or see a lot of customer service operations where they're just trying to add on a little piece of technology instead of like starting over because it really is totally different and they, they need to start over with their experience and think about it from what is the best thing for a consumer who may not have time to pick up the phone and sit on hold for, for 30 minutes. Well, I do feel like the companies that adopt the new technology first will be different. Like that's a differentiator. If you have better customer service than everyone else, like all your competitors, that's definitely going to make them stand apart. But Eric, the way you're describing it too also makes it sound like you think it should be a very process first approach and not like a technology first approach. So understand the process first. Would you agree? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a lot of what we do here uh, in the business application space. It really does come down to process first and, you know, the technology second. I think there's a perception that we come in with a, a technology solution for every problem. And it's like, well, it the, the technology solution might not actually solve the problem if you're not able to change your business process and the way you do things and actually not able to get consistency across that, that business process. So I was visiting with a client last week uh, with, with their CEO and asked, he was asking like, what can I do to make sure that this implementation goes as successful as possible? And as I had sat in on a few of the sessions where I was listening to them talk about how certain regions do things differently. And I said, you know, we just, you really need to focus on trying to get consistency around your processes as you head into this. Now you can either use technology as a as your excuse for why you need to make your processes consistent, or you can do work on your processes first and then apply technology to it. I don't care which way you do it, but like you need to use this opportunity to make your processes consistent because then your technology will actually get you substantial value and substantial return on investment 
if you try to customize everything for every diff little different way that somebody wants to do something, uh, your technology implementation is not going to be successful. So, yeah, that's why I think as you reimagine customer service, just reimagine the process. Like, start from scratch and say, okay, forget about how many people you have and what they do today and what your phone tree looks like today and all of those things and say, like, what would be the best experience? Like, who are my customers? Who's calling us the most? You know, where are they calling from? What times are they calling? Do they want to be able to call or access us at any point? And do we want, do they want to be able to do it on their phone? Do they want to be able to do it, you know, at their desk, wherever it is? And just think through all of those scenarios and go and then design the process around what would actually make it easiest for your customers. And if you do that, then you can like bring in the technology component and really delight your customers, which I think there's just huge opportunity there. And I think AI is really built well to, to help support that. I love that you said that. And what it brings me back to too, is again, those phone trees that you go through to be prompted to get to certain places. And kind of working in customer service often I've learned to understand phone trees. Like there, there's a reason they send you through all those buttons. It's to get to the right person. Uh, that still doesn't mean I love them. And I feel like general consumers too are just like, why do I have to press all these buttons? And it's really hard for people to understand like why that process exists. And so if you're talking about reimagining the customer service process, like you were just describing, what I get out of that is don't just think about what's going to be easiest for your business. Like, yeah, okay, pressing seven options is ultimately going to be best for the business to get them directly to the right person. But is that the best customer experience? You know, does it make sense to have a team that can handle multiple different types of requests instead of just having, you know, that one dedicated person that can handle that one prompt on the tree. So I, I feel like what I'm hearing is it's like a balancing act between what's going to benefit your customers and what's going to benefit your business. Yeah, exactly. And I used to run support operations at Microsoft in my early days. So one of the things I was responsible for was our phone tree and trying to get people through the phone system as quickly as possible. And then I had a message center, which that was back in the you know, right around 2000, where they would actually pick up every call and then route them to everyone. But there's so much efficiency you can gain by like using a portal and using the portal to sign in and say it. So everyone knows I'm Eric Newell and I have this phone or whatever it is that I'm calling about. If you can initiate that already, then I don't have to have, I don't have to, you know, dial one and then four and then six, you know, to say I want English and I have this model phone or whatever. Like use the portal as an entry point to save time and, and be able to move faster. And then with AI, like, you know, a lot of times I'm on the phone with someone, they have to go get their supervisor to be able to answer the question. But if they have, if they have a generative AI system there, like, you know, Bing or something like that, they can just be asking questions and they can get answers instead of having to go put you on hold for a minute and a half and go ask their supervisor a question. Like the power of of the Bing engine or the chat, the GPT-4 engine is amazing. And you can get some great answers to questions from that. So that's going to help them be able to answer questions so much faster. And then they can set up their own chat system internally if they do need to ask a question to somebody and uh, they can get answers right away. So just reimagining that whole experience, I think is gonna take you know the average interaction down from a half hour to, to just minutes. And many times where the customer service rep doesn't even have to be involved. I just think there's so much money and that companies can save with this and there's so much there's such a better experience they can give too so that's why I think that's like the number one slam dunk thing to do with AI I'm glad that you called out the internal chat too because I feel like I keep forgetting that that's also an option you know when you're so client facing or customer facing you're like okay how can I make this available to the customers how can I improve this process for them but you can do it internally too. And so I think that's a really great call out because 
um, you know, especially in call center contact centers where there tends to be a higher turnover rate, right? Then you're constantly bringing in new employees and needing to train them. And by giving them those types of tools, like an, a knowledge base, and then that they can ask questions to an AI chatbot or power virtual agent that can query that knowledge base to get them answers quicker instead of reading through whole articles, like that is such a value add thing too. So it doesn't have to be just customer facing. It can be internal to make your teams work more efficient too. And I think that that's so cool because it's bringing back that personal touch. So then you don't have to have so much automation that people get frustrated with. You can still let people talk to your agents, but by making them more efficient, you can still have the quantity of conversations that you're having that you were hoping to solve for by implementing a bot. Right. Because when you implement something like a virtual agent, you're trying to reduce the amount of human interaction to make things more efficient. But if your people are more efficient, then you can still give their customers that human interaction that they want. So my one of my jobs during college in the summers was I was a telemarketer. And so I would I sat in a cube and I had on this wall, I had a bunch of statements and this wall, I had a bunch of like my whole cube was filled with like answers to questions I was supposed to give. So I was selling discover card merchant services. So like allowing businesses to take discover card. And so, you know, I would read through my text every day, of, uh, you know, every call that I would make, and, you know, half the people would hang up the phone on me. But then when they would say, well, I don't know, this sounds expensive. I would go look at my response to that one and put, well, sir, uh, this isn't that expensive when you think anyway. And like everything was like already written out. But like imagine if you had all of that in a knowledge base where you wouldn't have to have you know, 18 year olds like me trying to, <laughs> to find the right answer to the question where you could actually have a response that comes out based on what they chatted in there and uh, and just move through that interaction so much faster. So. But uh, it does remind me of the old days with all of the papers on my cube walls to answer all of my questions. There's a better way. Definitely. <laughs> I have a question. It's a change, though. Okay. So I know sometimes, Eric, people express fear or concern about what AI will mean and like, what do we need to be doing? From a policy, legal, like, you know, governance perspective, what are your thoughts? Is there anything that, you know, concerns you about the direction it's going or is it all good in your mind right now? Yeah, that's a great question. So I've been talking a lot to our clients about like where we are in the evolution of AI. And we're still in this period of like artificial narrow intelligence where a AI isn't quite as smart as a human. I heard on one podcast recently that AI is about as smart, smart as a squirrel's brain now. So it's evolved from like a bee to now a squirrel. Well, it hasn't got to the human yet. So I don't think yet AI is particularly dangerous right now, but it can be in the future. Like when it starts to get as intelligent as a human or more intelligent than, than a human, that's when I think we need the policy is in place to be able to regulate some of that. So I think working on that now is a good thing for governments to be doing, but uh, I don't think for the average user now, you have to necessarily worry about that. I do think you need to worry about security as it relates to AI and just making sure that you're not posting things in an engine that's going to learn from that engine. I think there's copyright infringement issues that are are real right now as well too because there's 170 trillion parameters that gpt4 has looked at well that's probably a lot of people's books and things like that uh, i'll make a shameless plug for my book maybe they read through my book and and maybe i can sue them for copyright <laughs> ask a, a question about uh, you know testing and or something like that but anyway there's a tons of uh different things out there where there may be copyright infringements that uh, that I think is a legal issue that is a real thing. But for the average user, just be careful what you put into the prompt because that 
could be something that the engine continues to learn from. So don't go, put, go putting your you know deepest, darkest secrets in there from a company standpoint. Uh, otherwise, it could start using that. Now, we, we implemented Bing Chat Enterprise internally now, so that does lock it down and the engine doesn't learn from that. So if you are worried about, let's say you're like a, you know, a, a product development company that's developing rockets or some kind of, you know, sign where you're you're asking a bunch of questions in the chat because you're trying to refine how you're building your product or something like that. I would definitely recommend using like Bing Chat Enterprise so that your questions that you're asking, which may be something where you're giving something away, um, wouldn't end up getting exposed to the outside world. But and then just a lot of companies are not very well set up from a security standpoint to be able to manage their uh, manage their environment. Like they've got too many people have access to too many things and that could be a danger as AI starts to roll out a little bit more as well too. So that's one of the recommendations I have for people about AI is generally take a look at your security and make sure that you feel good about where you are before you go full bore into it. Eric, what did it look like to roll out Bing Chat Enterprise internally? Was there a lot of steps to do that? Was it pretty easy to do? I will tell you, I do use it. So thank you for implementing it. It's great. Well, yes, I uh, I only know because I asked the IT team how what how, what they did to be able to do it. But it was pretty straightforward. Uh, there was just some settings that we needed to change in the Office admin or in our Microsoft admin setting to be able to enable it. So it's actually pretty straightforward to do, which is cool. Okay. Is there an additional cost for companies to start using it? I don't think so. I think that but is is just something that you can plug in. And then what's coming is the ability to have that look at your internal content as well too, which I think is going to be super valuable. Because one of the things I hear when people start at Stone Ridge is, I do these 60 day reviews of people. I've got a couple coming up today. It's like, how's it going so far? What? And one of the things I hear a lot is, well, I can't find stuff on Teams. <laughs> and so I think when we can use that to like plug into our Teams engine to be able to find things internally, which it sounds like that's coming here very shortly, I think that'll be super valuable. I don't think that's just a Stone Ridge issue. I think no, that's no. a general company issue. <laughs> I hear that yeah. everywhere too. Yeah. Uh, so that'll be really exciting, but that also does test your security, right? Like if you've given everybody access to something you didn't mean to do that, now the search engine is going to be able to find that and share it with everybody. So that is one of the things that we're going to have to run through quick before we open that up to everybody, but I can't wait to open that up to everybody. So like, you know, who is our benefits provider and, you know, what kind of dental, you know, I just went to the dentist and they say, I need a, uh, you know, a gold tooth, is that covered by our insurance? Like those are the questions that we have to spend time answering internally. That would be nice if you could just type that in and get an answer to it. What are people going to do with all that free time? Everything's going to be so efficient in the future. <laughs> I think so. I think it's going to make things a lot easier if, if you're good at asking the right questions. But uh, yeah, maybe I'll just make some more, you know, mashed potato related dishes or something. But Today's contest that I have. <laughs> Probably not. Cheesy oh, hash friends, maybe something like that. <laughs> now you're making me hungry. Eric, I was going to ask uh, you to tell us about your book. Oh, so yeah. So <laughs> I wrote, <laughs> thank you for finishing the plug, but I wrote a book <laughs> called Mastering Microsoft Dynamics 365 Implementations. So I really wrote this because. I didn't think there was a book out there that really talks about how to go through the process of implementing Microsoft Dynamics. And it's really challenging thing to do that there are lots of steps. I mean, there's 23 chapters in the book and they each kind of go through a different area or section that you need to be able to know about how to implement Dynamics. And so I, uh, I worked on the sure step methodology back when I was at Microsoft and a friend of mine wrote the book about sure step but that was a really waterfall type approach to implementations that's really not being used as much anymore. So like I wanted to write a book that had this combination of agile and waterfall uh, 
which is what really we're doing today, or most companies are doing today. And I didn't think there was anything out there. So that was my little project during the pandemic. When I had a little extra time, I thought, well, I'll just get this book written because there wasn't something like that out in the market. So it's really designed more for customers to use. So if you are a customer who's about to go through an implementation, I would, that's the time to use it. I was uh, visiting my alma mater recently and one of the, uh, you know, 18, 19 year old kids was asking me oh, about my book and it's like, oh, if, you know, should I read your book? And I'm like, no, actually you probably shouldn't. <laughs> like, if you're not in the middle of an, imp it's not for everybody. It's not uh, going to be on Oprah's bestsellers. It's for those people actually going through an implementation that, or thinking about an implementation. That's definitely when you, it's more of a guidebook than it is a easy reading, uh, fun story. I love it. I think that's really helpful. All right. Well, thanks for sharing more details on the book. Um, I do have one question to tie back to, but I'll ask Liz if you had any other follow-ups before I circle back. No, go ahead, Allie. Okay. So this is kind of maybe an off-the-cuff question, but when you were talking about security around AI and being careful of what you enter into it and that AI learns from what people enter, in the age of misinformation, not saying that anyone would do this, but could people put wrong information into chat GPT and have it start learning from that and then potentially be spreading wrong information. Yeah. So I, yes, that is true. And I think everyone should set expectations about the results that you get back from the, the Bing engine that it's, basically pretty consistent with what you experience on the, on the internet, right? If you go search for something on the internet, you're probably going to get, you, I don't know, probably have a 90% chance of getting the right information, but you have a 10% chance of getting just junk out there too. And the Bing and chat GPT engines pretty similar. So yeah, I actually did a search the other day about, uh, about something. And as I got the answer back, I was reading through it and I'm like five of the six sentences I expect were correct. I didn't know the answer, but there was one sentence in there that I know was incorrect. And so that is, you know, something you're still going to experience with the, the engine. So if people do put more information out there, that's incorrect, it will, it could end up giving more incorrect answers. Um, one of the, explanations that I use in one of my speeches about AI is there was a question originally that went into the engine like if my if I'm six and my brother is half my age how old is he when I'm 60 and at first the engine was returning 30 because it thought well half and so when you're 60 it'll be half of that which is 30 but eventually it learned over the time that the answer was 57 so it will try to continue to learn and get the right answer, but there definitely is going to be wrong information out there, just like there's wrong information on the internet today too. So I think the best thing you can do is if you know you really need to get a right answer is follow some of the links and read up on it and see if that passes the smell test before you like put it on a, something you're presenting to the board or whatever. <laughs> I think that's a big difference between like the Bing enterprise versus the original chat GPT as well. Like if you go to the open eye is that it gives you the references and it's funny because sometimes when I look up stuff for work too, it references the Stone Ridge website. So I think it's awesome. Um, whereas sometimes they'll say Stone Ridge software. So it is kind of querying internally for us a little bit already, but it's the public website. And so I do always look at those references and see where it's coming from and kind of cross compare. And I think that's really, really helpful to make sure that you're getting the right information. Um, yeah, I think the Bing engine is the best one to use today because it's got the power of GPT-4 and it does have these references and it is continuing to learn. Like if you use ChatGPT-4 on the OpenAI website, while well, it's $20 a month to use it, and it doesn't always provide the references like it does in Bing. So why not use Bing? It's free and gives better information. So that's that's what I suggest people use. And I love that 
the either of the responses, either of the engines are so polite. I don't know if you guys have encountered this too, but sometimes I will say that's not right. And then they go, I'm really sorry about that. Let me try again. And then they kind of regenerate the answer. And truthfully, I feel like I'm contributing by telling it it's wrong, right? So it can correct itself. But I also love that it's very gentle in its responses and always apologizes to me. <laughs> it is very nice. It's very polite to work with. <laughs> yeah, but it does show you like when it does come to customer service as well too, like it, it can be programmed in with those kind of sentimental responses or it can understand and react to the way you type into the, to the chat as well too, so, which I think makes it even more powerful, so. Eric, so circling back to like the customer standpoint or people who want to use these AI tools, uh, a big topic of discussion a lot of the time is troubles with adoption or user adoption, getting them to adopt platforms. If we're starting to add AI into platforms you know, do you think that should be a selling point to get people to use the tool? Or do you think that it should be kind of done in a way to go hand in hand so they start using both platforms? Kind of like, what, do you, what are your thoughts on user adoption between like a Dynamics platform and AI and trying to get them to use both? Yeah, well, a couple ways as I think about like rolling it out to customer service. I mean, one way you could do it is you could pilot some things and just try it out first. And maybe that's the step you do before you reconsider your whole processes. But uh, I think getting users comfortable with it and being able to ask the right questions. So another thing that I talk about in AI presentations is like understanding how prompts work and like asking the right questions. So that's one of the things that we did at our company meeting was just you know, get everybody comfortable with using prompts. And I think that's something everybody should be doing. So if that's a good way to get people a little more comfortable with how it works, because it isn't exactly the same as doing a Google search that you've always done. You know, you want to ask questions a little more in a little different way and you want to be a little bit more specific. And sometimes you want to say things like, give me a three paragraph answer to this, or give me a one sentence answer to this. And so some of that stuff takes a while to get a little bit used to. So I think that's one good way to get people's feet wet in it. But when it comes to like rolling it out across your organization, you know, organization change management is a big part of how you would do that successfully. So making sure everyone's bought into it, they've got awareness and desire and knowledge and all those key components to be able to to do that successfully. So that's a that's a big effort. Believe it. All right. Thank you. Um, well, I know we are coming up on time for recording. Um, so this has been a really great discussion so far. I'll open it up to either of you, Liz, Eric, if there's anything else you wanted to share on this topic before we go into wrap up mode. Our signature question, yeah. But Eric, first, is there anything else you want to talk about or add? Uh, no, I, I'm good with going to the signature question. That sounds like fun. Okay. okay. Well, is and I don't think we have to explain what it is. So, Eric, what is your favorite hot dish? Tater tot hot dish. Ah, the classic. <laughs> I'm not even saying that just to roll back to the, the potato days reference, but that is the one that I like to make. I have had arguments with people about whether the cheese goes on top or on the bottom or the tater tots go, you know, top or bottom, but that is the one a hot dish that I make for my kids that, uh, that they appreciate and I actually enjoy making. So that's probably my, my favorite hot dish. And how do you make it? Where do you put the tots and cheese? <laughs> I put the tater tots on the bottom and I've, and, and I understand a lot of people put it on the top, and I've had some really heated arguments over with uh, with Kelsey and Allie uh, in particular from our team about whether the tots go on the bottom or on the top. So maybe I make it a little bit differently, I guess, but that seems... But they're not crunchy if they're on That's the what bottom. I was going to say. Yeah. soggy tots on the bottom. Yeah. We're about to get heated here, Eric. We are. We have opinions. <laughs> more people against me in this well maybe i'll have to try your version someday i don't think i've ever had it with shots on the bottom so oh, okay. and do you put vegetables in yours 
I put green beans. Uh, okay. My wife has suggested we try other things because she doesn't like green beans as much, like corn. No, it's don't, a common don't one. put corn on. <laughs> got to be green it's got to be french style green beans in my opinion and then you know you've got to have the uh, two cans of of cream of mushroom and your milk but then i also put like those little dried onion um oh yeah toppings on yeah there. like what you do for green bean casserole like the crunchies yeah, yeah right so if you put those into the meat as you're cooking it up i think that makes it taste even a little bit better and then just the like that salt at the end um do you guys like spicy food i do but i can't handle super spicy food okay well you saying the crispy onions now i'm like thinking of my own hot dish here but at trader joe's and i don't know if they sell them anymore but they sold like jalapenos that were kind of like those crunchy onions so they were mm -hmm. dried jalapenos but crunchy so that could be a good alternative too they weren't super spicy but added a good spice level so you'll have to keep an eye out. Maybe that needs to go in that hot dish. Okay. <laughs> we need a hot dish cook-off competition. <laughs> Good. You guys, you should have like a whole end of year episode where you all like make a bunch of hot dishes and you have the guests back on and you, you know, eat hot dish and talk about the last year of podcasting. That would be pretty cool. It would be. Eric, are you trying to get back on the podcast already? I am, yes. I'll give you like a month where I won't bug you about it and then I'll start bugging you about it. Remember that year in episode idea where we all had not did this? It'd be memorable, that's for sure. <laughs> it would be. All right. Well, thank you guys so much, Eric. Thank you for joining us. This has been an awesome conversation. It's always good to talk about AI. It's a hot topic right now. And you've shared yeah. some excellent tips with our listeners for sure. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me on. I appreciated it. And yeah, schedule me anytime you want. It's fun. Thanks. All right. Thank thanks, you. everyone. See you next time. Thanks for tuning in to Dynamics Hot Dish, your go-to podcast for all things Dynamics 365 and the Power Platform. If you found this episode helpful, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to follow us on social media for even more insights and updates on the latest trends and best practices in business applications and low code development. We'll be back soon with another delicious serving of dynamics and power platform goodness. Until then, keep innovating and building great solutions.